So diastolic heart failure is similar to systolic heart failure in that the heart doesn't pump enough blood to meet the body's demands. Okay, but how is it different? Well, if you look at diastolic, that kind of clues us into how it's different. And if we remember that diastole is that phase in the cardiac cycle where the heart's just filling with blood. So the heart's all relaxed and blood's filling into the ventricles and that's called diastole. So diastolic failure means that the heart's not filling with enough blood. And so if you just compare the two, if you just eyeball them, you'll notice how much less room there is with diastolic failure. And if we bring back our most favorite analogy ever, the water bottles, if you squeeze the healthy one, water ejects out. That's great, okay. But with diastolic failure, what if the bottle's not filled with as much water and you squeeze it? Obviously, less water is going to be ejected because there's less in there in the first place. It's the same thing with the heart. So if there's less blood in the heart in the first place, it's going to have a lot harder time meeting the body's demands and ejecting as much blood. So less filled means less ejected. Also remember how systolic heart failure had a lower ejection fraction, which is that fraction of blood ejected with each beat. And that's because, you know, there's about the same amount or possibly even more filled into the ventricles with systolic failure but there's less ejected. So naturally you'd have a lower ejection fraction. Makes sense, okay. But since diastolic heart failure has both filled and ejected lower, so both are lower, sometimes your ejection fraction can be the same as with a healthy heart. And we would call that a preserved ejection fraction. Okay, that seems a little confusing, right? Well, let's do an example and show how that might happen. Okay. So recall that ejection fraction is equal to your volume ejected, which you could also call your stroke volume, divided by the total blood filled, which we can also call end diastolic volume because it's the volume at the end of diastole. Okay, so say your stroke volume is 70 milliliters. Say your end diastolic volume is 120 milliliters. This would be considered, you know, quote unquote healthy. Um, 70 divided by 120 equals 58%. Okay, that's within a normal range. Cool. What if stroke volume is equal to 46 milliliters because of heart failure. It's a lot lower. It's pumping less blood. But your end diastolic volume is also lower. It's 80 milliliters. 46 divided by 80 is still 58%, technically in a normal range. So clearly, the stroke volume and the blood being pumped out is lower, but that's kind of covered up by your end diastolic volume being lower too. But just because that ejection fraction is preserved, that doesn't mean, you know, we're out of the woods. It's still heart failure. But how does this diastolic heart failure get to look so much different than systolic failure? Well, there's pretty much two ways. Uh, the first way is hypertrophy, which essentially means like growth of muscle. And, and when we're going to talk about that, we're, we mean ventricular muscle growth. Um, and when these grow, they take up more space. And since there's more space being taken up by the muscles, that means there's less space to fill, right? And secondly, is that these muscles, these growing muscles, get stiffer, and they don't stretch as much when they relax. Even though they're growing, there are these dead muscle cells in here too, because it's heart failure, and that's a main component, is death of muscle cells. So these dead muscle cells leave this fibrotic scar tissue, and this fibrotic tissue is like a bunch of connective tissue, and that connective tissue has a lot lower compliance. And Basically, compliance is the ability for the ventricle or for any tissue to passively stretch and expand during filling. And this is super important for the heart because more stretch, more compliance means that it can fill more. It can get more blood. Think of like filling a water balloon. When you put water into it, what happens? Well, it gets bigger, it expands, but this is like passive. The water is forcing it to get bigger. Now think about filling up one of those like glass flasks from chemistry class. I mean, I'm going to be really extreme here just to make a point, but what's going to happen when you fill it up? It's just, it's not going to get bigger. It's not going to change shape. It's just going to fill up all the way and then start to overflow and spill all over. That's because it's a lot less compliant. It's probably like one of the least compliant things we can think of. And it's the same with a heart with a bunch of fibrous connective tissue. It can't relax and it can't passively expand and it can't fill completely. So that's what's going on with diastolic heart failure, but how does it get like that and how do we get these enlarged and stiffened muscles? Well just like systolic failure, it's a secondary disease, which means that this growth and stiffening is caused by some kind of underlying disease that's been there before. And the big one that we tend to understand the most is chronic hypertension or high blood pressure. 
So when the pressure in your blood vessels goes up, they become harder to pump against, harder to pump into. And this is kind of like blowing into a straw versus like a big tube. Which one do you think is going to be harder to blow air through? It's probably the smaller one, right? Well, it's sort of like that for the heart, except that the heart has to pump blood through these narrowed vessels. And this is way more difficult to do. So what does your heart do? Well, it bulks up, it gains muscle, and it gets bigger so it can pump against these higher pressures. Now both diet and diabetes can both contribute to higher blood pressure and hypertension. And those are definitely big risk factors for hypertension and therefore diastolic heart failure. And the second underlying disease is aortic stenosis. And stenosis from the systolic heart failure video we know is a narrowed valve. And specifically we're gonna talk about this valve right here, this aortic valve. Um, and then that valve goes out from the left ventricle and pumps into an artery called the aorta. So similar to hypertension, it's a lot harder to pump blood through this narrowed opening as opposed to, you know, a valve that's opening all the way. And what happens? Well, the heart muscle again bulks up and gains muscle so it can try to pump harder through this smaller valve. Now this is a little tricky though, right? Because we remember that this can also lead to systolic failure. So what gives? Well, unfortunately, a lot of the mechanisms behind why in one case it might lead to this growth of muscles like in diastolic heart failure or it might lead to this serious weakening of the muscles like in systolic heart failure are pretty complex and honestly a lot of these mechanisms are unknown and still big areas of research. And next up you have cardiomyopathies which mean heart muscle diseases and sometimes these can be a little general but for diastolic heart failure in particular there's two that we're going to focus on. And the first one is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy which we can kind of figure out by the name hypertrophic or hypertrophy means muscle growth and so this cardiomyopathy causes muscle growth and this is often without an obvious cause and the second is restrictive cardiomyopathy which causes stiffer and more rigid muscles and this restricts the ventricles from expanding and these two cardiomyopathies kind of hit the nail on the head right because with diastolic heart failure you have either stiffer muscles or enlarged muscles Finally, there are some other causes and risk factors like old age and coronary artery disease even, but like I said before, some of these cross paths with systolic failure. And again, a lot of the mechanisms behind that are largely unknown, especially as to why one might lead to systolic failure and one might lead to diastolic failure. These are still big areas of research. So with diastolic heart failure, the heart muscles either get bigger, they get stiffened, or both. When this happens, less blood fills into the ventricles and the heart can't passively expand as much and therefore it can't relax completely. So ultimately you end up with this cycle that leads to worsening heart failure. So you start with some underlying disease like hypertension or stenosis that makes it a lot harder to pump blood to the body. To try and make it easier, the heart muscles increase in size and they get bigger and they bulk up. But these bigger muscles do more work so they need more oxygen. But with heart failure, you know, you can't supply more oxygen. So this leads to cell death, and that cell death causes this fibrosis and this stiffening of the heart muscle tissue. And then that feeds back into a lower blood supply, making it even harder to pump blood. You could also have other diseases like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that directly affects muscle size, or restrictive cardiomyopathy that directly affects stiffening. And this cycle progresses, and heart failure gets worse. 